Okay, I've got this um, on YouTube. I need to uh, make sure that my Discord channel knows what's going on. So give me a minute to uh, give my Discord channel a heads up. I'll make sure you guys can see the text though while waiting for everything. That'll make it a little bit less boring while waiting for me to kick things off here. Okay, and then I'll post the Discord link for those who don't have it. I'm a little bit more active on there. And well, I'm not by active, I mean uh, responsive to uh, comments. Um, Yeah, okay, so there's the Discord link for those who are interested. I'm a little bit more responsive to questions there than I am on YouTube. I still get really busy on uh, on um, weekdays with uh, my own work. Um, so I still only kind of get back to people on the weekend, um, but I'm a little bit more responsive there and we got a little bit more content. Uh, there's a few more people to interact with there. Um, so I think it's a little bit nicer than um, just being stuck in the YouTube channel. Um, yeah, all right, well, with that, I will kick things off at around 10.45.
Okay, I see your question in the chat. Um, <clears throat> Uh, I'll kick it off in a minute here. I actually would strongly recommend um, Don Martin's system design primer. It's pretty solid. I really recommend that for entry. Um, I do actually have a whole um, roadmap of um, resources. It's actually available in, um, uh, so uh, for my, my roadmap here, I'll put information on it. You can find it in either the Pound Readme channel on Discord. Um, otherwise, it's available in my YouTube community. Um, slash at, you can find it over in here. Let's not do that. Here it is. So uh, this post has it. And I got this roadmap at the bottom of the chart and it has, um, so this one's like a little bit blurry. You can find a bigger, I should have the image. There it is, there it is. Okay, that's the imager link. Yeah, okay, and I want the, let's pull it up in a new tab. I want just the, um, oh, my, my, there's this like console thing for um, uh, zoom up at the top of my screen that's getting in my way. There it is. Okay. So um, depending on where you are, I map it to a couple of different um, topics. So Don Martin System Design Primer is very friendly for entry level. Um, I, I actually put myself in this bucket of random low quality YouTubers. I just don't trust the average YouTuber, myself included, um, even though I am a senior FANG engineer. Um, which means that, you know, I'm, I'm not necessarily the worst uh, engineer out there in terms of system design, but I still put myself in that bucket of random YouTubers um, just because I don't like it's it's like I, I, it's crazy how low quality you get for some people that like their their credentials look solid. And then like I watched the content, and it's actually like shocking how like it just doesn't seem that solid. Um, grokking is kind of there a little bit more on the object oriented side. They're rather shallow. Um, I even have a mapping of some concepts on there, um, like an ordering of how to get familiar with them. Um, yeah, but um, yeah, so this is like a nice area to start off with. And, and Don Martin System Design Primer is actually a great resource for getting familiar with those entry level concepts. Um, I'm going to jump back to um, can maybe try to start it up now. I have one more question in the chat and we can go ahead and start kicking things off. But uh, yeah, I actually have a roadmap. Oh, I should have, um, geez, the bar at the top is getting in the way again. Okay, here, I'm gonna copy it here and I'm gonna drop it in the chat and also over here. Uh, so here that is in the, chat check that out um one more question in the chat before we kick things off is um do you know any resources books on cost analysis how much it would cost to run a design system on aws versus so cost analysis is actually something that it's um they kind of like that at the principal engineering level at Amazon for interviews is um, uh, um, so PEs at Amazon should have a cost awareness. Um, exact values for that are actually kind of hard to come across. Um, I think I did see something on CDN's cost and um, there was a thing about like cost per megabyte in a CDN and somewhere in one of Alex Shue's books, it was, um, he, he does have little bits of useful info every so often that are just really hard to come across, but in general, it's kind of a hit or miss material um, with Alex Shue, uh, but it's uh, cost analysis is, is actually rather hard to come by. You kind of have to do it yourself a little bit. Um, I would worry about latency estimates and um, machine count estimates before you worry about that. 
Uh, I'll, I'll write that down. Worry about machine count estimates first. And then um, latency estimates are kind of like a second priority. So like prioritized um, things to worry about, machine count estimates, uh, late latency estimates, and then um, cost estimates. Um, just my two cents on that. Could you write out his name? Oh, Alex Shu. Oh, um, so uh, just Alex Shu, um, the guy on LinkedIn, um, has some stuff on CDN costs somewhere. Are you guys able to read this all right, by the way? Uh, let me know if I need to zoom in anymore. I think this should be a pretty legible size, though. Um, so just let me know if, if you're not able to see it that clearly. Um, with that, I think we've got uh, all those first preliminary questions answered. Uh, about what do you feel the best language is to learn to get a fang roll? Um, sure. All right. One more question, then we can go ahead and talk about vending machines. Um, anything. It's it's literally it's uh, Java and Python. Whatever whatever's best for leak code. Whatever your best. Whatever you are best at handling leak code problems for. Uh, just your, your most comfortable language. So I, I would just do whatever you're using on the job right now. It's probably a great language. Um, particularly as you get more senior, it's more like they just want somebody that has the skills and like the language is like a, a secondary thing. I mean, for, for mid-level things and like more, more towards mid-level or so, they, they do kind of expect you to be more of like a back-end engineer or a front-end engineer and they require a little bit more specialization. I, I mean, I, I guess there's kind of some specialization in there, but even I, I'm, I'm a bit of a front-end engineer and I even don't do coding interviews in JavaScript. I wouldn't recommend trying to go out of your way to pick up a language. So it's literally whatever's best for LeetCode, as long as it's not something more arcane, like um, R or like, um, I don't know, um, R Golang is kind of arcane. I mean, they use it at Google, but even then it's like, yeah. Um, is LeetCode a requirement for Fang? Yes. How about performance analysis? Do you have any recommendation on performance analysis? Uh, I, I have a little bit of information on that in my Discord channel in the README. Um, you can check it out there. Uh, there's also Jeff Dean's numbers are pretty good. Um, all right, I think we're good to go ahead and move on and kick this off. I don't wanna get distracted for too long on answering some of these entry, uh, some of these, um, questions. Um, yeah, just feel free to shoot me them on um, Discord. Let's let's focus on, I think it's time to focus on vending machines. Okay, so we are going to be doing the system design for vending machines today. Uh, for some background on this, it comes from a personal interview experience. I really have received this interview question before. Um, it was for a senior role, and um, I actually did not do scale numbers at all. I somehow still managed to land the offer, which was crazy. I, I literally did not ask them at all to specify the scale that we would be handling the question at, and I somehow still landed the job. I have no idea how. Um, so this is a little bit similar to the hotel booking problem, but at a higher scale, we're going to do a fun extra feature similar to uh, the proximity service or Yelp problem. Um, so it's going to support credit cards as a payment method and um, as a fun extra feature, uh, we are going to have a web interface for finding the nearest machine that owns a specific item. So it's not like a, uh, it's, it's a smart vending machine. So it's, it's smart vending machines that um, would kind of have like a, a thing that you, you'd be able to track the inventory on it. Uh, you, you don't have to like go and inspect the machine to figure out the inventory. They're smart. They they have a some some stuff that kind of like monitors each machine. Um, yeah, so they're they're not entirely um, hardware. There's some kind of smart network connection. They're a little bit like 
uh, those Coca-Cola freestyle machines, if you've ever seen them in a uh, fast food place where you go up and there's like 50 different choices of drinks. Um, it's, it's a little bit like that, but with um, items as a fun feature, uh, you will have a web interface for looking up the nearest machine that has a specific item. Um, and then the payment service itself is a black box. You're just gonna use something like Stripe. Um, for uh, scaling numbers, we're gonna have, it's gonna be a really big uh, vending machine thing. And it's gonna be like if Amazon rolled out its own vending machines to bring their warehouse stuff a little bit closer to their, it's, it's, it's kind of like, um, what is it? Uh, Amazon Locker, but with vending machines. So it's going to be a lot of any machines, 10 million. They handle 100 transactions each per day. It's a little bit high, but we're going for like a very, very high scale vending machine thing that was uh, very successful with a, a tech company. Like if, if Amazon was rolling out vending machines, which is a, a worldwide company. And um, yeah, so it's that's the scale we're handling it for. We're going to assume a 100 to one read to write ratio. I think that's probably a little bit excessive. I like it though. Um, it, it would make sense for Amazon's case. It, I think it would make sense for Amazon's case where you like look up a specific um, charger or something, and then you want to find the nearest vending machine that has it. So you might do a hundred different reads for some, like looking at different items and which one's closest. And then you find the one you want, you go to the vending machine, you um, pay for it. And that is a write operation, uh, actually buying the item. Uh, and I did the math in advance because people seem to hate watching me do that. We are going to have 10K. Uh, it comes out to 10,000 payment operations being handled per second and 1 million uh, read operations on that web interface being handled per second. But we're going to do that as a follow-up. I wrote a little checklist because I keep forgetting to do load balancers, which is horrible. I, I actually forgot it in every single interview I did about a year ago, and I still managed to land like five offers. Um, but if you interview at Google and you forget to do the load balancer, I'm pretty sure that would result in a rejection. So um, that was, um, yeah, that's that's just some information to better prepare you guys. Is um, I managed to land five offers without touching load balancers, but if you interview at Google, I'm pretty sure you want to make sure that you cover that stuff. So yeah. Um, all right. Any questions about uh, vending machines and what we're doing before I jump into the diagram? All right. See a little bit more color on that performance analysis thing. Um, you know what? We will come back to this at the end. I don't want to leave you hanging on this. Um, so I'm just going to like bump that down and then. Um, I'm gonna make sure to cover performance analysis numbers. Um, turn to this. Uh, and yeah, I just wanna make sure that we get back on topic. And then um, somebody asked if I have a Patreon. I do not. I have actually been considering that more and more lately because I noticed that a lot of big channels have it. And um, I do get a little bit of ad revenue, but the ad revenue is so shockingly thin margin that it's like, um, I did the math on how many subscribers and how many views per day you basically need in order to have like a livable wage off of YouTube itself. And it's like running this channel would not actually be able to um, get me out of my day job unless I had like a bare minimum of 1 million subscribers or something, I'd have to be making videos and having them watched at the same rate as Fireship, basically, who has about 2 million subscribers. He has a bunch of 100 second long videos. I, I probably would not be able to quit my job unless I was making videos and getting the kind of view volume that um, Fireship receives. It's crazy. It's it's crazy just how thin the ad revenue is, but it's it's cool. I I mean I'm I'm doing this just kind of for fun. It's not like I'm. This is this is not like a money maker for me or anything. Um, we should really be getting back onto the topic. I don't see any questions about vending machines, so I feel comfortable with going onto the diagram. We can go ahead and kick that off. So, uh. I like to use this little box for anything that I consider to be the the client. So. 
now it's going to be uh, the physical vending machine is what we're going to have here. Let's make it look a little bit like a vending machine just for fun. So we're going to have physical vending machine. And we're going to do the location lookup part as a fun extra thing at the end. I don't want to cover that first because when I had this question, it was done as a fun extra thing at the end. And so we're going to take it as a similar thing. Otherwise, it, it, it does add a fair amount of complexity. Um, you're, of course, going to need a back-end service. So it is the transaction um, handler service. And then um, you definitely need, uh, so there's, there's kind of like two different uh, databases that I was thinking of with this, is uh, you, of course, need to track the inventory. Um, so we're going to have a inventory database for sure. So it is, uh, we'll have a inventory, oh, there we go, inventory data store. So you're gonna have a request come in and then um, so we're gonna have the inventory. We should also maybe have a transaction like state manager thing, kind of like what we had in um, our uh, hotel booking problem or an airline. Um, so we've got we've got this inventory table, but I also want to have a transactions, um, just like the thing that tracks uh, our status with the the payments. So we need something that handles the actual payments being processed and tracking that. Uh, and we are going to integrate with some kind of payment service like Stripe. So I'm going to have a, uh, uh, call it um, external payment processor. And so this would be something like, like I said, Stripe. They have awesome documentation on uh, the auth capture workflow. Let me write that down for you guys. Uh, I'm going to call that, uh, so it's auth capture workflow. And uh, Stripe has phenomenal documentation on this. And as a reminder, I'm going to attach this text file and a pinned comment at the end. That's why I'm taking care to type this stuff out is that so that way you guys would actually be able to um, pull it up and um, look these things up a lot more easily um, afterwards. Okay, so uh, we got this. It does the auth capture workflow. So you got a request that comes in. I guess the first thing that you could do is possibly, uh, I mean, there, there's multiple options for how you can go about the ordering of the calls here. Uh, you will definitely need to get a auth ID for your payment info from Stripe at some point. Um, whether or not you logged this, uh, the transaction in the transaction data store first, I don't really know. Um, I think you could wait until after the call to Stripe uh, to get the auth ID before you write it to the transaction data store. Um, I think that's fine because in this case, if you do make a second, if you, if you have to do a retry, that auth ID does not actually, that the auth step does not actually charge your card. It just stores a little bit of info. Um, so uh, having to retry the auth step does not actually result in duplicated charges. Um, so we're going to have kind of like three steps going on in this is that um, one, there is this auth step. Let's make the font not suck. Let's make it large. And then we're going to have the capture um it's the uh you're gonna have the actual payment go through call it the dispense step where you actually dispense the item yeah so we're gonna call it that and then um okay i think that's all you need but then we're also going to have to do something with um the what is it called there's the web interface. We're gonna do that at the end. Um, uh, reconciliation, I could try and draw something for reconciliation as well. I think we're gonna end up doing that in this case. Um, okay, let's maybe label our steps. So we're gonna have one is that, two is we're gonna make this round trip like that. Let me do um, one, two, three, there. 
I need it. I, I do that for direction for, you can either have it as like a push or a pull, but is that this calls this instead of this making the call to that it's your, your back end service calls the payment processor as opposed to vice versa. And that is going to be uh, step two over here. Let's call to there. And then we're going to log it in our transaction data store. Let's maybe go ahead and kick off the schema on that. Do that. And um, so for the schema on that thing, you're going to want to log that auth ID that you received from Stripe. Uh, you will pass it the payment info. Um, let's do something like that. It'll be some kind of UUID and um, you give it, oh, so you are going to give it your payment info. And then you're going to receive back a auth UUID. And so then you're going to log that auth UUID over here. Um, you could also log uh, payment info. Um, so one of the reasons why you might want to log the transaction before you try and do the payment processing is that then you can do retries on the payment processor multiple times with that same info. Um, so we could go ahead and store payment info there. Uh, and we'll stick it in brackets. It's like a uh, there's like a bunch of attributes to it. So you could have it as like a sub object. So it's it's um I I I think in terms of um Dino DB a lot because I'm just so used to it from um, my time that I spent at Amazon it was with Dino DB, which is, it looks like a document store, um, but it supports like a bunch of um, secondary indexes. You can have up to like 20, maybe 30 secondary indexes on Dino DB. And you have this like big JSON blob that looks like that. And um, so I'm just used to thinking in terms of that. So you have the payment info. I think you should have this like items list, like what items they're trying to buy. So you have a bunch of different items. Um, and then you just have this like item, uh, item info over here, some kind of blob about, um, it'll be like an item ID. So you can have, um, like item ID and the quantity of that item that you're going to purchase. You also want to have, oh, I think you should have like the machine ID. So you're going to pass over, oh, no, you're going to pass over your payment info. And you're going to have the machine ID. Like that. Oh, and you need the items. You need to tell it what you want to actually buy. Look at that. I'm just kind of getting distracted with the, the, the comments. I'm, 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 um, we, we're not, I want to focus on the problem. Okay, so we're going to first, this comes in, two, you're going to get an auth ID, and then um, three, we're going to do this thing over here, which is, um, whoops, let's make that large, so three, log the auth ID, I think that's all we really need here, and then we can separate everything else out as the capture. So first, we're going to do this. And we haven't actually dispensed the item. Um, and I think you can even check internally on, the machine can have its own independent counter of the quantity of an item. So then if you select a thing and, the, it, and it just already knows that the item count is zero, then it will just not kick off this whole first half of the workflow. All right, and now let's go ahead and do the capture step. So you got the capture step. We're going to return back that auth ID as well. And we're actually going to use that for the capture step when it actually wants to dispense the item. Okay, let me think through this a little bit. Is um, So you have a partial failure scenario where 
you um, so you need to dispense the physical item and you also need to capture the payment for it. And depending on which one goes first, you could either end up with ch uh, charging the customer and not dispensing the item, or you could dispense the item and possibly not actually capture the payment. And um, so we've already captured the auth ID. And then it'd be weird if, um, if we don't see that followed up by the physical vending machine with a capture occurring. So what if the vending machine loses its network connection between the auth and the capture step? Um, so my, my personal opinion is that we um, do this thing where it's, uh, hold on. Okay, so my personal opinion is that what we do is um, one auth step and then two dispense physical item, and then three, we do the capture step. And so then there's the potential, there's this, this the, the, that sets it up so that the way that our partial failure scenario would roll out is that there'd be this dispense and then potentially you might miss the capture step. But by looking at the track transaction data store and just doing like maybe a daily scan through it, you'd be able to find out if there's all these um, uncaptured uh, uh, things that were made. If you have a bunch of um, uncaptured um, payments that are, are in the database, you'd, you'd be able to scan through and like look for that. Um, so, and then you could just go ahead and roll it through. So it's like when when the vending machine reestablishes its connection, it can finally redrive that capture from here over to there. And um, it can just be stored on the internal state of the vending machine until it does reestablish its connection for doing the actual charge on the card. And the off step does reserve the funds until the capture step is run. So it's not like they can go off and blow through all the money on their card. And then you wouldn't be able to properly capture it. The, the off step does properly seize the funds. And then if you don't run the capture step after seizing the funds, it just releases them back to the card. Um, but I think this is a pretty graceful uh, way to handle the, the, um, the, that risk of the partial failure scenario. Uh, the, the alternative is, of course, um, that you try and do the capture step before the dispense, but then there's this risk of um, possibly charging them without dispensing the item, which is a really bad customer experience. But then you don't have the risk of possibly failing to charge them. So it, it just it, a little bit of it is depending on your business priorities. But I think even if you do just really value not having that risk of um, even if you do really value um, trying not to charge the cost, uh, if God, sorry, my I'm I'm so bad at speaking today. Okay, so let's say that the business wants to avoid ever giving out free items. Let's say that the business ever wants to avoid giving out free items. I feel that even under that scenario, even though that's a greater risk here, I think that it reasonably handles. There's there's ways to properly handle it even under this ordering of the steps that the risk is still pretty minimal and you can still go with this approach and it would still uh, just be a better customer experience. Um, but that's that's my two cents is this, this can handle that failure scenario pretty gracefully. Uh, let me know if anybody has any questions over that. Um, see a couple questions in the chat. Let me go through these really quick. How would you structure the call if we were to support multiple machines for different items? Like if I was buying an item one from a machine and item two from a different machine, you'd you'd, you'd handle that as different transactions entirely. And so um, my expectation is that you would not have two machines side by side and you'd run your card once to handle it with two machines. So handling a purchase on one machine and on a second machine would require two swipes of your card. So, um, those are two separate transactions. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's, it's separate calls. Um, okay, let's go back. All right. Um, so I had step one there. We're on to step two. Um, instead here, you're gonna reuse that auth ID. So now you are going to run that auth ID through. You've dispensed your item, and now at some point, um, the auth ID, you're going to run that through. So we're going to run up 
that. We're going to send it over the transaction handler service. And um, this is item potent. So if even if it, you like drop the packet over here, over the network, uh, you can retry it safely without any issues with um, double charges or anything. So, um, uh, you know, I can draw a little cache or something on the physical vending machine to represent um, auth IDs that need processed. Let's bump that down. And then I'm going to move that over here. It's going to be the auth ID data store. And so that would be transactions that need to be processed. Nice. Here we go. And I want to make this a little bit smaller. I like to do that when it's, so this is a little bit like a physical cache or something. Um, I wouldn't call it a cache. It should be persistent. You should have a, a hard, so it, it could be a local, um, have like a local PostgreSQL instance or something like that to store these. Um, but it's just a list of auth IDs that have yet to be processed. Okay, and at some point you're going to be able to properly process it. If not, right after the transaction, you could do it when it gets reconnected. You have that, and then um, you can rerun it over there. We'll have a status of um, you would say um, pending, and we could say charged. So after that runs, we would update the status to be charged. And we could then um, could then do our update to the inventory data store. So two, three, and then four, we're going to update that. Um, and so that would be an interesting partial failure scenario of um, incrementing that, I think you could also have an incremented status. And so then you could come back as a fifth step and also update the transaction data store to show that was properly incremented. Um, so I'm going to say three is, oh, let's do that. So three is update status to charge. And then we're going to have five Make this medium um, up date status to increment it. And that's just for, for the inventory, making sure the inventory is up to date. There. Okay. All right. Um, we have the follow up to. Um, I should make sure that I have handled everything that I want for this first piece though. Um, load balancer, oh, hey, I haven't been using the load balancer so far. I should do that. Um, I'm pretty sure, so we're gonna be hitting this at 100,000 TPS, uh, 10,000. We're gonna be hitting it with 10,000 TPS. Oh, I also need DB schemas. Um, we should, we, let's do the DB schemas and the uh, load balancer here before we move on to our fun extra step. So for the load balancer, we definitely do need that. I do that copy paste tricks so that the arrows don't stick when I'm trying to add something between them and whatever they're connected to. So in Excaladraw, you might have seen these light little circles there, and that means that it will stick. And um, that's why I do that copy paste thing. But uh, yeah, you're going to need a load balancer there. Um, you don't need a sticky connection. I'm not super familiar with load balancers, but um, I think you want it at L5. You do not need an application level load balancer. You just need something that um, works fine for non-sticky connections. You, you need to handle like WebSocket connections in a special manner. And that's why you sometimes need to use um, a different thing like Envoy, I think. So from, from WhatsApp, you would need a special load balancer that handles um, persistent connections. And there's this 
thing called Envoy that handles that differently, but um, you can just use one of the lower network tiers for this and just terminate the connection at the load balancer in this case, just fine. Okay. And we're just gonna reuse this. Let's stick that here. Okay, and then the arrows are, are being a little bit messy here. That's why I do the copy paste trick so that the arrows will stick to it and I'll draw. Cool, so we got the load balancer. We need schemas. I got one the transaction data store. We still need the inventory um, data store. So let's go through that now. And um, so for the inventory data store, we have a, we need the machine. ID will be three, four, five, six. You'll want a item ID. And um, so we'll say six, seven, eight, nine. And um, I guess we could do item. I don't know if we really need item name. I don't, I don't think we really need item name. That could be in the thing. And I, I mean, you would, you would need to figure that out somewhere, but it's not really as relevant as that. It, the, the item ID could be, you know, cached on the physical machine. And so you don't really need to pass the actual item name back and forth. This thing could actually know what the item name is from a, a monthly call to a different data store to update its um, internal listing of items and how to display the name on it or something. But you don't actually need to have the, uh, the item name anywhere. And then we need the count of that single machine's um, number of that item. So it might just be like eight. Um, so a given machine will have like 30 items or something, or maybe 50, and it'll have up to like 20 of each. Um, yeah. And um, so we could, we could potentially have this issue with a double count, a, a double decrement of a specific item ID. Um, as a retry scenario. I'm not super worried about that though. You just handle that from rec reconciliation. I think it'd be better to over decrement it than to under decrement it because you don't want to show a item as available where it could actually be um, completely sold out of that machine because then your user that's looking for it in the web interface could drive up expecting to be able to buy the item in the vending machine and then they'll see an empty row on it. So um, I'd rather over decrement a counter than to under decrement it because that would just result in a better user experience. Okay, um, I got the schemas. I've got a load balancer, um, just a L4 or just physical hardware load balancer, whatever ELBs are, uh, elastic load balancers on AWS are by default, work fine there. Um, let's move on to the um, the web interface thing. So we've got this. Let's go ahead and copy, paste it over here. And then um, we are going to delete these. And uh, I'm just gonna have like the line connecting all of this stuff. I don't know what we're actually going to use for the web interface quite yet. You're not going to need the external payment processors. So that's just going to kind of be a dead connection. You're not really going to do anything with that there. Um, and okay, so we'll need a browser or user looking up an item. Got that. They have a specific item ID that they're going to look up. Okay, we got this. Zoom in a little bit. So, what all do they want to know? So, we have an item ID. You'll need their current location. You will need their current location. That's right. 
Okay, six, seven, eight, nine, I think was an item ID we we're gonna use. Yep, there it is, okay. And you can have their user location, which will be some kind of like latitude, longitude. Um, and uh, I think we'll give them back a list of um, latitudes and longitudes for where they can find it. So what they'll get back is um, a list of lat longitude for the given item ID. Okay, so we got this. I think we need a third data store for item locations. And this thing will be very rarely updated. So we'd have a machine, we'd have the item ID, and instead of account, it will just be um, the location of a machine. And this will need, um, I'm gonna go with an R tree. Uh, you can use um, PostgreSQL as the database. I said that these are going to be updated very rarely. Um, so we have 1 million vending, 10 million vending machines. Um, let's say 100 items each. 10 million vending machines, 100 items each. And you would only write on this thing whenever you need to update the items that are stored in the machine, which is gonna happen like maybe once a week at absolute most, that'd be crazy. I think uh, you, actually you'd, you'd probably rarely change up the, like on average, you're only gonna change up the inventory of a machine I'd imagine like once a month. So then it would be 100 times 30, 3000 times less write volume than the transactions and the transactions are at 10K TPS. So this would be a TPS of less than 100. Maybe it'd be like 10. Yeah, it'd be, it'd be less than 10 TPS for how often you would do a write operation on this thing. So you would just do like leader follower replicas. And um, I think you could probably fit all the information within a single data store, like a single node. So then, um, or you could shard it by region, like you would have like the Asia replica replicas uh, and the North America replicas over in the data center in the US. Um, and so let's do this. We have a whole bunch of read replicas and you would read directly off of the read replicas. And um, Postgres has a R tree index that you can use. That's why I specified R tree. Um, Elasticsearch has quad trees. And so, I mean, that's another option, but you don't really need to use a crap load of secondary indexes. That's when you would want to use Elasticsearch is if you actually do have a whole lot more different um, secondary indexes that you need to use. I don't think we actually need to go crazy on the secondary indexes in our use case. So we're probably fine. And then um, these are the read replicas. Can I make this pointed? Yes, there. So read replicas there. And then you just have your entire instance is, um, this is the item locations data store. And so then when you're doing your location lookup, it would just go off of the read replicas. It would just hit one of the read replicas. Round the edge like that. And I need that to be a solid line. I think that's all you're going to need. Oh, oh, you need to find out where it is. And then you need to do the check of whether it actually has it in stock. So first you're gonna find the closest vending machines with the item. And then second, find out if it's actually in stock. Let me write that down. Let's 
make that extra large, sure. And then two, step two, So then you're gonna do a second call to here. And we're gonna do one. Okay. And then we're gonna do two. There, cool. And then you can return the result. And I don't think they actually care how many items are there. Oh, well, I mean, I guess they could, like, what if they want to have um, three chargers or something? And so then you would need to um, Yeah, okay. So what if you wanted three chargers? And of course, you want to get it in a single trip. And so then you would check that the inventory data store for each of those machines actually has at least three for the count. You'd return that. Um, but I still think they don't really care exactly how many chargers, as long as it's at least three. And so you don't actually need to return the count as part of the response. Um, you'd be fine without sending that over. Um, that should handle it though. And um, this is actually slightly better than the response that, oh, you know what? You need a load balancer over here too. You particularly need a load balancer over here because that is 100 times the scale and it's at 1 million. TPS. And that's actually not an unrealistic TPS. I've actually um, interviewed and received offers with teams that actually handle um, TPS of like 10 million. I think one case was actually 60 million. I think that was the most extreme TPS I've ever seen. I've never worked on production systems that handle more than like 10K TPS though, but this is not like that. That's there's real production instances of having 1 million TPS. It's not totally unrealistic. Okay, let's go ahead and bump this over to make room for a load balancer that is going to be absolutely crucial in this case, because that's 1 million TPS. I mean, it was pretty important in the other cases too, um, but yeah, I don't think you can handle 1 million TPS without a load balancer. Well, so it's going to be geographically distributed too. You'll have users in Asia and in North America, and so each one's going to have its own um, uh, set up within its like localized data centers for each region. So there's going to be like an Asia data center, and then there's going to be the North America data center, Europe data center. Um, but still, you're, that that means it still is going to be several hundred thousand TPS hitting each one, which is a lot. You would still, of course, need load balancers within each data center for handling that load. Um, okay, I think we've got everything that I want. And I do see a question in the chat. I'll get to that in a second. I want to go through my checklist real quick. I got my load balancers. I've got the CDNs. Should maybe talk about partitioning keys too. So um, we're going to go through um, partitioning keys, secondary nexus. Um, so I'll get to your question, then we'll do this, and then we'll get to this, and then we can call it a night. That might handle it for you. I'm not familiar with API Gateway myself. Um, when I was at Amazon, we actually used ELB, um, Elastic Load Balancer, for um, our own services, and it just kind of handled it for you. Um, API gateway might be a thing for exposing APIs of, um, I don't know what it handles for you. I think there's some kind of nice off handling for API gateway. It might be like a nice thing for handling off of your users when you want to ex uh, expose an API of your website for your users to um, be able to call directly, possibly. Um, I don't really know what all the advantages are of API Gateway over an ELB. 
I think ALB is a little bit more bare bones than API Gateway. Um, yeah, I actually can't really um, answer that a whole lot. Um, Don Martin System Design Primer might actually talk about it, but um, I haven't seen, there's, there's no information on either of these and um, DDIA actually doesn't have anything about it. Um, Alkshu might have a little thing about an API gateway somewhere. Um, it handles like a bunch of stuff for you. I think it's like off load balancing, um, reverse proxy stuff, um, multiple things. And um, in Elastic Load Balancer is like a subset of the things that an API gateway handles. Um, I wish I knew more about that though. I, I've, I've not ever had to use these directly myself, unfortunately. Um, Don Martin might talk about it. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, partitioning keys and secondary indexes. So on the transaction data store, um, so you have the auth ID, I guess you could give it a transaction ID of its own. Um, I think you could partition, oh, you could partition by the machine ID. I think the machine ID would be really good for a partitioning key here. I think, yeah, I, I really think the machine ID is a good um, partitioning key. You can of course pass that with every single request it would be trivial to attach the machine ID to every single request. So that would make for a great partitioning key. Um, auth ID, I guess you might have a use case. That would that'd probably make for a good um, secondary index. Um, okay, we definitely need a sort key though, because partitioning key on its own is not going to be uniquely identifiable. So I guess the auth ID, which will come back from the external payment processor could make for a good sort key. And then um, that would mean that we would actually require the step to occur before any logging of the transaction data source. So it's on the fence about whether we could maybe just log a transaction coming in and then do the payment processor step for the auth ID, and then we log that, and then return a response. Um, if we tried to log the transaction um, as a first step prior to any interaction with the payment processor, that would um, remove the ability to have the auth ID as a sort key, um, because it'd be null until that is updated. Um, so I think auth, uh, the auth ID might actually make for a good sort key here. Otherwise, you'd need to roll your own transaction IDs, um, just some kind of means of doing that. Um, I was like, um, so then you would need to talk about generating your own UUIDs. You can't just use an auto increment, and that's a little bit challenging. I would trust that Stripe's not going to generate um, uh, duplicate um, auth IDs um, in the same day or prior to at least one expiring. So I, I it, it should definitely be a sufficient sort key. Um, yeah, okay. And then let's look at the inventory data store. Um, I'm feeling machine ID as a partition key as well. Um, in case you need to look up multiple items off one machine or item ID, or yeah, should you, no, 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 no. You could have a hot partition issue with item ID. And wait, yeah, yeah, you could have, you could definitely have a hot partition issue with an item ID. And usually uh, these transactions will happen within a context of a specific machine. This is looking like a good partition key. Yeah, and then you would of course need this as a sort key to uniquely identify each one. Yeah, that'll do. Um, and then we haven't actually talked about this yet. Um, I'm assuming that all this gun is going to be able to fit on one machine. Otherwise you would, um, maybe partition by the machine ID. Um, 
wait, you would look up item ID. Oh, oh, okay. So you would actually want to partition my item ID in this case, I think. If, if you had to partition here, because you're doing key range queries. And so even though you can have a hot partition issue with an item ID, um, since you're doing a key range query and you return multiple, you're, you're doing a search over this thing and you're going to return multiple of those for a specific item ID. So this would actually be the partition key if necessary. But I'm uh, assuming that we would use um, PostgreSQL. It fit on a single machine um, and it it's very rarely ever written. So like, if you did have a hot partition issue, you could actually just make even more replicas of whatever it is that's really hot. So you don't actually need to worry so much about the hot partition issue. Um, it should it should be fine. You definitely do not want to do scatter gather though. You don't you don't want to do hash partitioning to handle a a hot key. You would you would just go ahead and so you'd have that hot partition. And so then you would just roll a whole bunch more read replicas of it because it's very very read heavy in this case. It's a factor of like thousands, maybe 10,000 X. The, the read to write ratio over here is, is like one to 10,000 or something. So any kind of hot partition issue in terms of reads, you just roll way more read replicas easily. And um, that's why I liked this R-Tree PostgreSQL solution over here. Yeah, that, it's, I, that's why I like this problem a lot. I, I really liked this particular aspect is that it's, um, uh, you know, it's like Yelp or proximity server, but it's ridiculously read heavy. And then um, the hot partition issue, if you ever had it, is just very interesting to solve in this case. Um, and then I didn't talk about DB solutions for anything else. I definitely need to do that too. So for the transaction data store, so that one's going to have a lot of write operations. You're not doing key range queries. Um, I think you can go, oh, you probably need stronger consistency. You probably don't wanna do eventual consistency. Um, I think, um, I guess you could do sharded, manually sharded PostgreSQL, or I thought Dyno, DynamoDB has strong read consistency. You can, you can use DynamoDB with um, strong read consistency. And that should actually work just fine here. And then over here, got this counter thing. Um, and that one's going to be written a bit. So I think, again, you can use DynamoDB with strong read consistency, and that should also work pretty well. And this is actually also going to be read heavy. Um, so Cassandra would actually not necessarily be any more performant. Cassandra's a nicer choice when you're write heavy, um, but over here it's read heavy anyways. So DynamoDB, yeah, that actually works pretty well here, I think. And then it's it's just weird seeing PostgreSQL in, in a case like this that's so high volume, but it, it, I think it really would work out very cleanly here, like shockingly cleanly. So uh, I, that just makes this problem so fascinating is that you can use PostgreSQL so high scale, it would actually be super clean. Uh, yeah. Okay. I don't see any other questions in the chat. I think we're doing pretty solid. I'm pretty happy with my solution so far. Let's go ahead and zoom out for the people watching this asynchronously on YouTube. Got the, um, the auth step of the auth capture workflow. Then we have the capture step of it. Documentation of, for that is on Stripe. Pretty solid documentation in Stripe for that. And then I rolled the, um, the web interface step over here, the, the extra web interface. Um, what is that uh, feature, the extra feature over here of the web interface? Cool. Um, yeah, so I don't see any other questions. Thanks for joining me, guys. You guys are free to go. Uh, yeah, I'll see you next week. Thanks again. Bye.